The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. No, I'm not. Uh, Kelly couldn't be with us today, so I'm pinch hitting. My name's Alan Hicks. Uh, if you don't know who I am by now, where have you been all this time? Uh, I'm going to be doing a talk on TCP IP, basically uh, just a real quick primer because I don't really have a whole lot of time to go into depth into everything. This is just an hour talk. Uh, it's going to go over, you know, just the fundamentals from uh, the physical layer on up into, uh, you know, the network layer. And uh, if you don't really know a whole lot about this stuff, uh, you know, you'll probably learn a few things. If you already kind of know this stuff well, maybe you'll learn something. If not, you might find it a little boring. So, uh, oh yeah, I gotta use this little PDF reader. A couple quick terms. Uh, everybody probably knows what a node is. It's just anything that has an IP address, essentially, or any sort of thing on a network. You know, maybe it's a computer, maybe it's a router, a switch, a printer. Anything, you know, that you can address via a network is a node. And uh, a frame, You've probably heard the term packet tossed around, you know, we have uh, look at your TCP packets and stuff like that. Well, we often uh, in network engineering refer to them as frames, especially when we're dealing with the lower levels, you know, something lower in the stack like uh, the uh, Ethernet or uh, 802.11. When we start talking down there, we generally say frame. For purposes of this, if I say frame or packet, it's pretty much the same thing just so you know. And I'm going to uh, go over basically the five layers real, real quick here at a glance. If you're familiar at all with the OSI model, which doesn't entirely apply to things like ICMP, but it's, uh, you know, this seven layer model where you have uh, different stacks that a network frame or whatever goes through to arrive. Uh, we're only really going to discuss five of them because that's the only five that are really commonly used. There's a couple more. You don't need to know about them. Uh, first up is the physical layer. Uh, and when we're talking about the physical layer for this talk, we're just going to be talking about essentially copper wire. You know, it could be fiber optic. It could be uh, some sort of radio wave. It could be, you know, laser transmission, infrared, something like that. But but we're just going to be talking about uh, copper wire. And oh yeah, uh, sorry I didn't say this at the beginning. If you got any questions, you know, just blurt them out. Don't feel bad about interrupting me. Don't raise your hand because I'm getting blinded by the spotlight. I'll never see you. Just, uh, you know, blurt something out. So uh, again, physical layer, we're just going to be talking about copper. And when we talk about copper wire, like your patch cables and whatnot, uh, they, those transmit binary zeros and ones as voltage fluctuations. We'll show you how that happens in a little bit. The data link layer is really the first interesting layer. When you're talking about Ethernet, you're actually talking about the data link layer. You're not talking about uh, Internet protocol. You're not talking about TCP or UDP. You're talking about Ethernet. It's a little bit different, and a lot of people don't know or understand that yet. This is uh, what's responsible for making sure these bits, this frame, gets from uh, wherever it is on one network or on one subnet or one LAN to where it needs to go next on that same subnet or LAN. You can't do any routing at the data link layer, but uh, that's why we have next up, oops, the network layer. Uh, this is where you start talking about IPv4, IPv6. This is where you actually begin to actually be able to route frames or packets from one network onto another or onto the internet at large. Uh, the transport layer, that's basically when you're talking TCP, UDP, 
Uh, ICMP kind of straddles both the network layer and the transport layer. It's a little funny, but for purposes here, I'm probably just going to lump it in with transport. Uh, and that's uh, the only part where it's able to actually guarantee that your data got to where it was going. And it can do that optionally. It doesn't have to. It's just an option. And uh, the application layer, which is, you know, basically what makes or receives the frame. You know, say Firefox makes your Git request, you know, Git index.html. That's your data portion. And then it gets passed off to the transport layer wrapped up in that. That gets passed to the network layer wrapped up in that and so on and so forth. And like I said, there's other layers like the session layer and whatnot, but they're not commonly used. If you're dealing with those things, you're beyond this point. You know, you're beyond what I can discuss in this talk. That's things like multicast and uh, much more serious junk. So let's look at the physical layer a little bit more in depth. Like I said earlier, it can be anything from radio waves to laser beams to copper pairs. We're only going to discuss copper pair. Uh, a long time ago, it was all coax cable. Uh, but copper cat5, cat5e, cat6, so on. Those and its derivatives are by far the most common. And so what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, when you start to add it all up, and his comment was, you know, they're the most common for local area, not necessarily for wide area networks. But yeah, when you begin to add up, you know, all the different types of cable, copper is still going to be, you know, the biggest. Uh, and when you're doing uh, copper, basically voltage fluctuations, that's what registers as your binary digits. And I have a nice little graph here with made up numbers. So if the numbers don't work, you know, don't blame me. I just pulled this out of my butt. Uh, here you can see uh, our X axis is essentially time. Our Y axis is voltage. And right here at this, uh, you know, right around three volts, we have essentially a blank and empty bit. So whenever it's above that three volt, three volt value, it's a binary one. And when it's below that three volt value, it registers as a binary zero. It's important to realize, you know, digital stuff is really analog. It's analog stuff that's just interpreted digitally. You know, we can't send, uh, you know, when we send, make these uh, voltage fluctuations, it's going to go on a sine curve or a sine wave. Uh, and so values above a certain bit are one thing and below it are another. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, somebody's nodding their head. That's good enough for me. Uh, physical layer devices. I used to say this was anything you could kick, but now you know you've got Wi-Fi and you can't, you know, kick radio waves. But uh, you know, this is anything that's you know a physical part of the network, from network interface cards to hubs to repeaters. Uh, a repeater. That's just basically. Uh, well, when we're dealing with Cat5, fiber optics a little bit better about this, but when you're dealing with copper cables, after you get a certain distance out, you get so much interference from, you know, just the wire itself, you start to get, you know, a drop in voltage due to the resistance in the wire. And so a repeater is, you know, a device which reads those, then amplifies it and sends it back out so you can, you know, stretch a, a copper cable a long distance. You don't see very many of these. Uh, media converters are something somewhat similar where you, maybe you have a fiber optic cable and you need to uh, switch it into a Cat5 to go into a switch or a hub or whatever. Uh, you know, those are essentially taking, you know, one physical media and converting it to another, similar uh, in how they work. Hubs, we don't really use these all that much because they're stupid. I mean, they're called dumb for a reason. You can think of these as splitting one cable into many. You know, you've got one cable coming out of your computer and it goes into a hub and then there's 23 other cables that come out of it and they go to 23 other computers. Well, when your computer sends a frame, a packet, whatever, out its cable, when you're using a hub, 
every other computer is going to see that same frame, even if it's not meant for them. They're stupid. They're dumb. They just, it's just, duh, I can send data. And so they send it everywhere they, you know, possibly can. We don't use these today because we have switches. Switches are much better, and uh, they're a layer two device, which we'll get into now. Um, the data link layer, this is actually Ethernet. Or 802.11, there's several others, but those are the most common, most prevalent. Uh, data link layer have addresses of their own. They're not IP addresses, they're called MAC addresses. Media access control. I'm sure, you know, most of you have heard about MAC addresses on your NIC and stuff. It's a 48-bit number, I believe. Uh, if I'm recalling correctly, it's been a couple years since I've done this. Uh, and it's usually just physically assigned by the manufacturer to the device. You can change it depending on, you know, uh, your particular hardware, but usually there's no need to. Uh, when a frame goes out on, say, Ethernet, uh, it includes, you know, it, the, uh, there's two MAC addresses that are included, a source MAC address where it's coming from and a destination MAC destination MAC address, which is the next hop that it's going to. And uh, we'll understand that a little more when we begin to talk about the uh, network layer next. But with the data link layer, you can't do any sort of routing. There's no routing whatsoever. Uh, you have uh, essentially computer A with MAC address A, computer B with MAC address B, which is your router but you're wanting to send to computer C, which is halfway across the world. Well, the, you have no idea what MAC address, I mean, what MAC address C is, what that computer C's MAC address is, because it's not on your local area network. You can't directly reach it. As long as all your systems are essentially on that same subnet, on that same physical LAN, uh, and you don't need to do any routing, you don't actually need the network layer. But without it, things uh, stop getting interesting because if you can't do routing, you can't really reach very far. And that's why we're not all running IPX today. Uh, if, any, if anyone remembers that from, you know, the no veil days, it died because it was not routable. You just could not do very much with it. So uh, we'll look at some of these data link layer devices. Yeah, I was right. They are 48-bit 40 bit numbers. Um, and like I said, it's the only address used to deliver a frame to its destination. The IP address, which is used later, is only used to determine routing. And uh, there's also a protocol called ARP, which allows you to determine an IP, a, MAC, a MAC address from an IP address, but we're not all that inter interested in it right now. Uh, LANs connected with hubs will send frames to all attached nodes. Nodes are, are responsible for discoding, discarding, I can't speak today, discarding any frames that don't match their MAC address. So let's look back at hubs. Remember we had, you know, 24 computers hooked up on this hub. And computer A sends something to computer B. Well, computers B through, what is that? X, yeah, X would all receive the same packet and only computer B would have that MAC address. So C through X would all see it. They would look at it and say, this doesn't match my MAC address, and they would drop it in the bit bucket. Computer B would see it and say, hey, this matches my MAC address. Let me accept it. As you can imagine, that's very inefficient. That's why we have switches today. Uh, bridges. Bridges are what we mainly used before we had switches or before switches were cheap enough to really use everywhere. A bridge is like a small switch. Uh, it maintains a list of MAC addresses on different sides of the bridge. So, you know, let's take our 24 computers again. We'll break them into two switches, or two hubs, I'm sorry, on, you know, 12 over here, 12 over there, and a bridge that sits between it. Well, if computer A sends one to computer B, and they're both on the same hub, the bridge will see that and discard it. 
and then, you know, computers, what would that be, M through X, something like that, would never even see that frame because the bridge that sits between them just dropped it. Uh, we used those pretty heavily back before switches were, you know, economically feasible simply because uh, it was a great way to reduce the amount of uh, waste that hubs generated. Now that we have switches, switches are essentially bridges on every port. You know, if you've got a 24 port switch, it remembers MAC addresses on every single port. And they're cheap enough that we can put them essentially everywhere. So if computer A sends a packet out to computer B, it hits the switch, the switch says, okay, out of these 24 ports I've got, this MAC address matches port two, which goes to computer B, and sends it out port two. Ports three through 24 never see it and never get sent down them. And that greatly reduces the amount of bull crap going over your wires needlessly. Um, you can see why that's a big improvement over hubs and it's why we don't use hubs today and why we call hubs dumb. Okay, so the network layer. This is probably the only one you're really greatly interested in. It's, I think it's the most difficult to learn. It's the most rewarding. It's the one that actually does routing. It's, it, it's the biggest layer for a reason. It does a lot of different stuff. It does it well. And uh, it's just, it's fun. So without the network layer, like we discussed, you could only have uh, packet sending back and forth on essentially the same LAN. You couldn't do any routing, just like the old IPX days. With the network layer, uh, internet protocol version 4, version 6, whatever, uh, that's what allows us to do routing. I'll show you how that's done. Uh, based on the destination IP address, it uh, does a subnet lookup. And we'll discuss that on the next slide. Uh, most commonly thought to only include internet protocol, but there's others. Don't ask me to name them, because uh, I probably could have two years ago when I wrote this, but I long ago forgot about them. Okay, let's uh, look at IPv4 real quick. These are 32-bit numbers, 2 to the 32nd power. That's, you know, 4 billion something. It's a big number. IPv6 addresses 128 bits. That's a honking big number. Uh, two to the 128th power. I would not have room on this slide to write that number. You know, it's uh, incredibly big. We're only going to discuss IPv4 because, uh, you know, we're all waiting for IPv6 to slap us upside the face and say, why didn't you do me 10 years ago? Uh, I'm mainly doing v V4 here because, like I said, don't have the room to put everything on the slide if we do V6. Yeah, colon, colon, and you split, yeah, but I didn't want to go through all that work. Uh, we generally look at IP addresses as, you know, four octets, basically two to the eighth power, dot two to the eighth power, dot two to the eighth power, dot two to the eighth power, like 192.168.1.1. But the network device sees it entirely as one 32-bit number. This 32-bit number down here is 192.168.1.1. That's the way your, way your switch, the way your router, the way everything else is going to see it, just as that 32-bit string of binary numbers. So subnetting. Uh, Subnetting, this is what's required to determine if an IP address is known to the sending node or the router. Um, think of it as being uh, local. Uh, subnets are denoted in two ways. We have, you know, octet or mask. Uh, and when you look down here, you know, you see 255.255.255.0, which we commonly call a slash 24 for shorthand. If you look at it as the 32-bit number that the device sees, you can see why it's a, a slash 24. The first 24 numbers are 1. 
the last are all zero. If you have a slash 25, that first zero will be a one. A slash 26, the first two zeros will be a one. A slash eight, the first eight will be one and then everything else will be zero. That's how we come up with, uh, you know, these funny 255, 255, 255, 248. Uh, so, you know, it may help if you, when you see those funny subnets somewhere and you're not entirely sure what it's doing, think of it as a binary number that's 32 bits long. Uh, so subnetting continued. IP address and subnet mass, this is what determines whether other IP addresses are reachable without contacting a router. If you've looked at your routing table before on Linux or Windows or BSD or, I don't know, Tron, uh, you'll see things like 192.168.1.0 slash 24, no gateway. 0.0.0.0 slash 0, use gateway 192.168.1.1. What you see there when the, uh, you're looking at the routing table is if it's in this subnet, I can either address it directly or I have to use this router. Um, the, uh, the subnet mask is a bit mask that hides part of the IP address. Let me show you on this next slide what that looks like. Okay, this should be 192.168.1.1 slash 24. You can see the first 24s are 1. And uh, everywhere we have a 1 in the subnet mask, we just ignore that value in the IP address. So once we get down here to the last 8 bits, we can see, you know, that's 256 IP addresses in there. I can route to these, uh, I mean, I can get to these 256 IP addresses without contacting a router. Uh, and, yet, and like I said, the first 24 bits, they hide everything the last 8 bits are available to the LAN. Everything else has got to go through a different route, usually through a router. Uh, and if a frame, you know, it's going to an IP address not in its local subnet, it has to go through a router. There's other network layer protocols other than uh, IPv4, like I discussed above. ICMP kind of straddles both the network layer and the transport layer. There's also ARP. This is what determines uh, or, or uh, allows you to resolve an IP address to a MAC address if you're on, say, the same subnet. Uh, basically, you know, it sends out an ARP packet that says, who has dot three? And then when dot three gets it, it says, I have dot three, this is my MAC address. And that's how you uh, resolve MAC addresses to IPv4 addresses. It's very simple. Uh, and remember, frames, they're only delivered to MAC addresses, not IP addresses. The IP address is just used to determine routing. People think, you know, well, send it to this IP address. You're not actually sending to an IP address. Your node goes out to a MAC address. It then does a routing lookup. It hits another router on a MAC address, does another routing lookup, and so on and so forth. The transport layer. Uh, this is the only thing that can optionally guarantee data delivery. It's a little bit different with uh, 802.11. 802.11 actually has atomic operations which require uh, explicit uh, notification of delivery. But 802.3 that we're looking at, you know, Ethernet just sends the data out and maybe it gets there, maybe it doesn't. We don't know. And, and the data link layer, the network layer, they don't care. The transport layer is the only one that can optionally guarantee the data got to where it's going. This includes TCP and UDP. There's other protocols. I'm not going to discuss them. Uh, it adds additional information to uh, determine what application should receive the data portion of the frame. Like say, you've heard someone say, you know, well, Apache listens on port 80. Well, you know, a TCP packet gets sent out. It lists port 80 as the destination port. When the uh, server receives it, it says, okay, 
I'm on port 80, I need to send it to this application, which is Apache HTTPD. Make sense? It's responsible for delivering and receiving data straight from the application layer. Uh, in the reverse thing, Apache says, okay, I've got your git index.html, here's your index.html, and it wraps it up, sets the source port as port 80, the destination port will be the original source port, and that's how the, uh, the uh, two different endpoints know which applications to send the data between. Because you may have, you know, your laptop may be connected to, I don't know, ftp.slackware.com on an FTP connection and secure shelled into that box at the same time. Those port numbers are what help determine which uh, application data gets sent to so that your secure shell, you know, encrypted data doesn't get sent to the FTP server and, you know, your unencrypted FTP data doesn't get sent to the secure shell. If that happened, I suspect both applications would crash. So uh, transport control protocol, that's TCP. This is one that gets used the most. Uh, it's, uh, you can think of it as UDP smart cousin. Uh, it uses a series of handshakes to guarantee data transmission. Uh, TCP always assumes that the media, you know, whether we're talking about radio waves, fiber optic, whatever, whether we're talking about going across the internet or going across the room, it always assumes we can't rely on the data actually getting there. So it requires an acknowledgement. Uh, every frame that gets sent out, it's got to have a corresponding acknowledgement returned saying, I got this data. Uh, if it doesn't get that, it resends it until it gets it or gives up. There's basically four types of TCP frames or, or yeah, frame types that get used. SIN, ACK, FIN, and RST. There's some others like explicit congestion notification. We're not going to deal with those. They're, they're pretty rarely used, and if you need to use them, you're above the level of this talk. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, three-way handshake first. This is what's used to set up a TCP connection. Uh, say you're communicating to slash dot dot org on HTTP. Uh, your laptop, your desktop, whatever, will send out a TCP send packet. That means synchronize, start. When the server receives that, it has to acknowledge it. It acknowledges it with a synchronized acknowledgement frame or what we call a SYNAC. Uh, and then you have to tell the server, hey, I got your acknowledgement. That way, both endpoints know that we're communicating fine. Stuff isn't getting dropped to the destination. Stuff isn't getting dropped going back to the original source. Uh, and when it gets that packet, it sends a SYNAC with an ACK frame. Or, or I'm sorry, it, it responds with an acknowledgement. We sometimes call this a SYNAC ACK. Uh, and once we've got that done, we can start exchanging data. You know, data packet says get index.php, and then it replies with an acknowledgement, and then start sending a data packet with, you know, the actual web page. And every data packet for that you get, you send it back an acknowledgement. And that way both uh, endpoints know where we're going. There's a way to close it down too, called a four way handshake. This is used to gracefully close a TCP connection. You can also close it with an RST packet, which just basically terminates and tears down everything. But let's, uh, W gets a, a useful one to think of here. Let's say node one is your desktop and you're doing a, a W get of, I don't know, some ISO, you know, a big file, a DVD. You send out, you know, get, DVD, whatever. It starts sending data, and then WGET says, you know, well, I'm not going to request anything else. I'll send a finish packet, a fin, and Node 2 will reply with a finish acknowledgement. And it, it can continue sending data at this point. The uh, connection is called half open. 
No one can keep sending, or no one won't send any more data frames, but no ten, no two might. It'll continue sending that ISO until it gets done, at which point it'll send a finished packet, and you'll have to send back a finished acknowledgement. Uh, and, and once again, if you don't understand anything, you know, shout. Uh, and then, you know, this is basically continued. You know, once the servers finally finished sending the uh, the uh, ISO file or whatever it is, you know, it sends its final finish, and then at that point, the TCP connection is terminated. Uh, TCP connection can also be terminated with an RST flag. You know, imagine your uh, uh, router or whatever is just getting completely flooded. It can say RST and start shutting some of this crap down, or it can just, you know, silently drop it, and TCP will slow down. But uh, data flags like git index.php or here's your document, here's your ISO, those don't have any special flags. They're just raw. All those flags are set to binary zero. Uh, and every data, data frame has a sequence number. You know, say, here's your first packet. It'll be sequence number one. Here's your second one. It'll be sequence number two. Now, here's your third one, but maybe it's dropped somewhere along the way. You don't get it. Here's your fourth one. Here's your fifth one. Here's your third one again. Well, then, you know, once you get that third one, it can go back and insert the data where it's supposed to go. Uh, that's why we have those sequence numbers there, because we can't even guarantee that the data will get there in the order it's supposed to get there. Uh, and every time you get a data packet, you have to acknowledge it with an act. Uh, just like we said before, if the sender doesn't get the act for whatever reason, maybe you didn't get the data, maybe it didn't get the acknowledgement, either one could have got dropped, it will automatically resend that data. Uh, and this is something I already kind of briefly touched on with, you know, the application layer speaking to TCP over ports. You know, HTTP opens a socket on port 80. Uh, data gets sent on that socket to the application. Uh, when the kernel gets one that says, you know, here's the TCP port, it's port 80, we, uh, we uh, take it and send it to HTTPD. Uh, every TCP frame has got a source port and destination port. Say, you know, Firefox, pick some random high number port, we'll call it 12345. Uh, the destination port may be 443 for an encrypted connection. Those will get reversed when the acknowledgement gets sent out or when any data gets sent out. So then the destination will be 12345 and the source will be 443. Um, and it's those port numbers that tell the kernel which application I need to give this crap to. UDP is the brain dead cousin of TCP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what he said is, uh, strictly speaking, the random source port gets determined by the kernel, not by the application. There's a lot of very good reasons for that. Uh, one of them is that, you know, if you've got multi-user systems or multiple applications running at the same time, if you allow the applications to independently determine that, they might even, you know, randomly pick the same one. By pushing it to the kernel, you can sort of guarantee uniqueness. Uh, now on to UDP, like I said, it's the brain dead cousin of TCP. It just basically says, duh, I can send data. It's not worried about whether the data actually gets there, uh, whether some of it gets there and, and some of it doesn't, whether none of it gets there. It just blanket sends data. Uh, it has a lot less overhead than TCP because you're not sending all these acknowledgement packets. You're not doing all these handshakes and stuff. So it's very good for certain things like voice over IP, uh, you know, things where it's more important that data gets there as quickly as possible than uh, that all of the data gets there. 
you know, when we're downloading an ISO, we get kind of pissed when we find out that there's a few bits that we're missing. Uh, when we're doing a voice over IP, you know, discussion for five minutes, and, uh, you know, you miss a few microseconds of someone, you know, speaking, we might not even notice it. Uh, so it's very good for those sort of uses that need speed over reliability, and I know what your next comment is going to be, Rob Ott. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, it uses ports in the same way as TCP. If you're doing any sort of VPN, like OpenVPN, uh, I don't know, IPsec, you want to use UDP instead of TCP uh, for a lot of very good reasons. The uh, most important is the fact that when you start encapsulating TCP inside of TCP, you get double acknowledgments, you get double slowdowns, uh, it just doesn't operate as efficiently. Let's look at, say, I'm doing a, uh, I have a VPN that's uh, on UDP and it's encapsulating a TCP connection to send mail. So I send out, you know, my port or I send my data on port 25 and before it goes out it gets wrapped up and encapsulated in this encrypted UDP packet. Or whether it gets encrypted and then gets encapsulated in a UDP packet. If that UDP packet doesn't get where it's going we still have that uh, TCP session that was started that knows, hey, I haven't gotten an acknowledgement back and I can resend it. If we then wrap that up inside another TCP packet, we have two TCP sessions that say, I didn't get my acknowledgement, I need to resend. And so you can get ACK packets that have to get you know, wrapped up and then re-acknowledged and it just gets to be a mess and doesn't perform as well. That's why you shouldn't use something like Secure Shell as a TCP VPN for anything other than, you know, a quick and dirty solution. It just isn't going to perform well from a network standpoint. So the application layer, this is uh, what's responsible for crafting the actual data portion of the frame. And this can be anything from, you know, HTTP, send mail to, I don't know, your... Uh, your favorite online game. There's some that are more closely tied to the networking concepts like DHCP and DNS. Uh, for this talk, we're just going to discuss those. Others are pretty much similar. Uh, and when you're doing like a, a service type protocol, they're kind of used uh, for determining usually the destination port. Because, uh, you know, when you're doing, say you open Firefox, Firefox is automatically going to say, unless I'm doing an encrypted connection or you say otherwise, I'm going to go to port 80. You know, unless I have a proxy server that says go to port 8080. Uh, if you open a mail client and you do, you know, I want to pull down pop mail, it's going to say, unless you specify otherwise, let me use port 110 because that's the port that nearly every pop 3 server runs on. I did get that right. It's 110 that's pop, right? It's 143 that's IMAP. Yeah. I sometimes get those confused. So while we still got a little bit of time, we're going to take a simple packet from the beginning, you know, a simple data packet, wrap it up in each layer, and show you what it looks like throughout the entire thing. And uh, for this demonstration, I'm just saying payload here. I'm not going to put the actual data. We'll say it's git index.html. Whatever it is doesn't really matter. It could be some cooking recipe. Uh, you know, it could be this discussion being transmitted later on over the internet. Uh, so uh, we're going to say, you know, it's just a 32-bit payload just to make it look pretty on my graphs. The first thing that's going to do is get wrapped up in the uh, TCP or the transport layer, and we're assuming TCP here. UDP looks similar. It just doesn't have, you know, as many flags and stuff. The window, I believe, is not there. I'd have to double check that. But the first thing we have is a 16-bit source port number, a 16-bit destination port number, a 32-bit sequence number, a 32-bit acknowledgement number. Uh, we have 
a couple other fields which I forget at the moment. We have five or six bits for flags, six bits for flags. Uh, and then we have a 16-bit window. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head what that window goes to, but I don't recall. Then we have, you know, a 16-bit checksum of the whole thing. Think of it like an MD5 sum of the packet. It doesn't actually use MD5. I'm not sure what algorithm it uses, but, you know, it gives you an idea. Sort of like parity. And then urgent pointer. I can't remember exactly what it is, but you get the idea. So, you know, say it's an HTTP thing and we're going to use source port 12345. It'll be binary, you know, uh, 12,345, binary 80. And it's the initial one. The sequence number will probably be, probably be 1 unless you have some sort of randomized sequence number. Uh, some systems do that, some don't. The acknowledgement field, because this is an ACT packet, will just be zero. Uh, and then the flags, since it's a data packet, there aren't going to be any flags set. Uh, and so this should give you an idea of what the binary packet actually looks like. Uh, I can't go into every field because, quite frankly, I don't remember what they all are. Then we're going to take what we just wrapped up, and you can see down here at the bottom, I've got TCP header and payload. We're going to add the networking layer onto it. The first bit is two bits for version. Or is that version? I can't recall. Maybe it's four bits. Yeah, it's four. Uh, so usually this is going to be binary four. Pretty soon, hopefully, it'll be binary six for IPv6. Uh, and when you have IPv6, the stuff's going to look different, especially because your addresses are now going to be 128 bits instead of just 32. 32 looks a whole lot nicer on this screen than 128. Uh, you've got a few other fields here that I'm not going to go into, like type. Uh, generally, they're all going to be of the same type, but you might have some uh, GRE packets, things like that. Uh, not going to get into all that. The total length, I believe this is in 32-bit uh, words. It'll be like the total length from the beginning of the IPv4 packet to the end of the payload. Uh, and that should be 16 bits. Uh, then you have an ID number. I forget exactly what that is. You have a 1-bit F. That means, is this a fragmented packet or not? If it's one, it's fragmented. If it's zero, it's not fragmented. Then you have a fragmentation offset. Uh, if it's fragmented, you know, this will have a value of, you know, where in the chain does this packet belong? Uh, and if, uh, you know, if it's not fragmented, that'll all be zero. Then you have a TTL, that's time to live. And when you start thinking about time to live, don't think about uh, real time. Like, this is not a field of seconds. The routers have no idea when the packet was generated. It might have been generated, you know, instantly, you know, a few milliseconds ago. It might have been generated 15 days ago. The time to live is actually the number of hops, routers, uh, things like that, that uh, it will go through before it finally says, hey, I'm not getting where I'm going, let me give up. Uh, and I believe that's six, no, that's eight bits. Eight bits in size. So what, two to the eighth bit, two to the eighth power, you can do 256 possible hops is the maximum. Usually something like 30 is what TCP, uh, I mean, uh, trace route uses. If you can't get there within 30 hops, that's a pretty long chain. But uh, basically, every time a router sees this, it uh, decrements that number. You know, it might be, let's say, 30. Then your first router gets it, it changes it to binary 29. The next router gets it, it changes it to binary 28. And on down the line until it gets to binary zero, and that router drops it. Just drops it on the floor and forgets it ever existed. Uh, Protocol, I'm trying to remember exactly what that is. 
and I don't. Mm. Good point. Good point. You're exactly right. And, it, and his comment was, that indicates essentially which transport layer protocol is in effect, whether it's a TCP or a UDP. You could probably determine that just by looking at you know, the whole thing, but computationally, it's a whole lot faster to look at which bits are on in this protocol field at the network layer than it is to, you know, well, let me strip down here and see, you know, is this, you know, is there a window here? Is this an IP address? And, and you've got to remember, there's no handy fields and stuff here. It's just a long-ass binary number. Uh, so having that protocol field there, big, big help. And header check, again, you know, it's sort of like a checksum type thing. Uh, I should really go on Wikipedia and look that up because I could be telling you, you know, a complete story. Uh, but I do believe it's, you know, not, it's not exactly a checksum, but uh, it's something similar. And again, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, sorry. Now let's look at, uh, once you get done with the network layer, it's determined, hey, I need to go hit my primary gateway, my default gateway. Let me grab my default gateway's MAC address. And I'll put that as the destination MAC address. That's a 48-bit number. This is my source MAC address. It's a 48-bit number. I'll put it in there. Then I have, you know, the IP header, the TCP header, the payload. And then we have a Ethernet checksum. Uh, and this is only for 802.3. Other protocols are going to look different. This is just Ethernet. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, other protocols, especially 802.11, they get more complex. You have a lot of additional fields and stuff. But for this, uh, you know, that's all you have. Destination MAC, source MAC, and then a checksum that's at the bottom of everything else. And this is, you know, the last step before we send it out a wire. So let's say we set it to uh, our default gateways, destination MAC address, our source address, our source MAC gets set there. Then our default gateway picks it up. Well, at this point, the default gateway says, okay, uh, I've got this packet. Let me strip away this entire MAC layer. It'll move up to the uh, network layer and say, well, the destination IP address here isn't mine. I've got to send it on. Let me do a route lookup. Okay, now I need to send it to this next router to get where it needs to go. So it recrafts this MAC layer, and it says, okay, I'm going to use my source MAC address. Again, we're talking about the router's source MAC address, and the destination MAC address will be the destination MAC of the next router in the hop. And that's how we go from one machine to another machine. Then we tear it down. We rebuild it to go from machine two to machine three. It tears it down, rebuilds it to go from machine three to machine four. It tears it down and so on and so on until eventually it gets where it's going. Does that make sense to everyone? And so you can see here that this is why the MAC address is what actually you know, determines or, or where things are actually sent. And the IP address is just determines, do I need to uh, send it out here? Do I need to send it out there? Do I need to use a router or what? Any more questions? Because uh, that's pretty much the end of my presentation. Come on, somebody give me a question. <laughs> that question is so stupid, I'm going to allow my chauffeur who's sitting about one row behind you to answer that for me. Any other questions? Okay, uh, you're, you're asking uh, essentially, say, uh, say this laptop is connected by Ethernet to the switch way back there in that room, and I'm trying to get to a laptop that's, you know, a fictitious laptop over here. When that switch gets 
uh, the frame, how does it know which, uh, which port on that switch to send to get to this laptop over here, is that correct? What it does, that switch will look at the IP address and do an ARP lookup and say, uh, you know, which, uh, if it doesn't already have it, it will say, uh, and it should, but it'll say, uh, you know, what uh, machine has this IP address, and when it sees that ARP packet uh, come in on that port, it'll, it'll say, okay, this port matches this MAC address, and so it'll send for that MAC address out just that port. Make sense? An ordinary switch, no, but that's a simplified way of putting it. Generally what happens is my laptop sends out an ARP packet and then the switch will see that ARP packet when it gets returned and match it up. Uh, right, right. And you do have layer four switches, but or layer three switches, but that's my understanding as well. Did I not put it, you know, proper? Yeah, and generally in the switch you refer to it as an ARP table, so that might be why it's confusing. Right, but you know you generally do, and maybe I'm just a little confused there. Uh, I believe you had a question, sir. That's a little bit more complicated. Uh, and I can imagine some events where, where you have essentially, you know, let me open Firefox over here, Firefox over there. We're both going to connect to Slackware.com at, you know, essentially the same time. We're both going to use the same source port. Uh, that could get a little freaky. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure how the kernel on the router handles that on the NAT side. Uh, generally speaking, unless they come in at the exact same time, you'll have different sequence numbers, different acknowledgement numbers, and it can use those to determine, you know, which uh, one it goes, uh, or, or which one it needs to unnat to. Does that make sense? Am I saying it right? Right. Yeah, that may be. Did these people answer your question sufficiently? Okay, uh, basically they were saying uh, when, the, uh, when your NAT router gets the packet, uh, say it gets one from here and one from over there, they go into the same place, they have the same source port, whatnot. When the kernel gets it, it will actually change that source port when it leaves the NAT router or, or when it does the NAT uh, translation it will change that and then when it comes back in it will look that up and say okay from this source port I need to change it again to this destination port to get back to here uh, and leave it the same or change it to some other value to get back to here. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Come on somebody give me a hard one that these people can't answer.
because MAC addresses do not allow you to do any sort of routing. Uh, right, basically he's saying, why do I do, you know, slackware.com, a record, and it doesn't give me a MAC address? The answer is MAC addresses aren't routable. Is that, is that basically what you were asking? Okay, the answer is MAC addresses aren't routable. Uh, say this laptop has a MAC address of, well, I'm not going to make up a number. We'll just say one, okay? And Slackware.com has a MAC address of two. Well, since Slackware.com isn't on my local area network, the data link layer can only send to, you know, essentially physical devices it can reach without going through a router. If I say, you know, a record dot two MAC address, I have no idea from this laptop how to reach dot two. I know what, you know, dot three, four, five, all the other boxes here are, but dot two is something else. It's somewhere else. It exists outside the universe of the data link layer for this machine. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, could some variant of the machine Some variant of what? Uh, I think the algorithm that you're referring to is Dijkstra's algorithm, which is what, you know, OpenBGP and, or, or BGP of any kind uses, which says, you know, how many hops do I have to go through to reach this IP address? The answer is no. Uh, it wouldn't because, uh, how do I, how do I answer the because part? Uh, again, let's say, Okay, I have BGP running on here, and I want to get to dot two, which is slackware.com. Okay, uh, I can say, okay, from this box here, you know, go to my router, which is dot three. My router looks across the entire universe it knows of and says, okay, where's dot four? Uh, or where's dot two? Well, I don't have a dot two. Let me ask dot four if it knows about dot two. Let me ask dot five if it knows about dot two. Let me know ask you know dot six if it knows about dot two. And suddenly you flooded the entire internet with all these uh, connections trying to locate every single MAC address in the universe. Uh, and it's just not efficient. Yeah. Because they're not on the data link layer, they're on some other. Right, from, from the IP layer, you know, you can mix and match these. Uh, and it's most often mixed and matched on the data link layer. Say, uh, you know, I'm going from Ethernet to 802.11. Well, they both have MAC addresses, they're similar. Maybe you could kind of make it work. But let's say I use some other protocol, uh, you know, your GSM. It's not a MAC address. It doesn't operate in the same way. If I give it, you know, a GSM address, it's not going to know what the hell to do with it. I believe you had a question, sir. You had a question, sir? Uh, duplicated MAC addresses? I've only seen it occur once, uh, personally. It does happen. Basically, these MAC addresses say what? Right, right, because every single device has to have a unique MAC address. Uh, and these, these MAC addresses get set by the factory. Uh, the government or some organization says, okay, Cisco, you can use IP addresses um, or MAC addresses from 1 to 10. And then it says, you know, HP, you get 10 or um, you get 11 to 15 or whatever. Uh, and now I've got about 30 seconds to go. So to wrap it up, you know, you're going to have some overlap. And we really wouldn't want to have, you know, 48 machines get the same packet that's destined for Slackware.com, you know. 
Slackware.com could share a MAC address with LemonParty.com for all we know. Dot org. Dot org, whatever. <laughs> and if you got any more questions, these two will be sure to help you. <laughs> As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.